All right, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, I'd like to add my own comments to the discussion right now concerning the absolute crisis in the NHS, which the media is focused on staffing. But I want to throw in a, a few things to consider that may be of interest to people. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So essentially, the Conservatives constantly talk about supporting the NHS, but they have been undermining it for 12 years now. Since Labour were last in office, waiting times are through the roof. It's incredibly hard to get an ambulance in, in lots of parts of the country. Getting an appointment with your GP is nigh on impossible. And the waiting times for both diagnostic and treatment surgeries is insane. Some people having these put off for years. And this isn't COVID. This was all happening before then, as this is, is very much in the public conversation today because some of the mainstream media shine a bit of a spotlight on it. Someone posted up an article from February 2020. Now, that's before the pandemic was having any impact on Britain. We knew about it, but it wasn't effective in, in Britain at the time. It talked of the partner of a 47-year-old who had breathing difficulties. They tried to get them an ambulance. They told them, you know, you'd, go, you'd be like ours. So... They drove them to the local hospital, but the emergency centre was closed. Emergency centre has closing times. By the time she was actually able to get into some medics, he'd died. The situation's way worse now. A couple of weeks ago, it was announced that all ambulance trusts in England had had to declare critical incidents. This was before the major heat wave of last week. They'd already had to declare critical incidents due to an increase in demand caused by the heat which wasn't even the record heat at the time, along with severe staff shortages compounded by COVID. The NHS in general has shortages of over 100,000 staff altogether, and this has not been improving. Boris Johnson tried to claim that he was sorting things out. He wasn't. The working hypothesis has to be that there is no intention to sort these problems out. It's a deliberate attempt to undermine the NHS in order to claim that the public funding model doesn't work and we need to adopt a US-style health insurance model. Never mind that the US has the worst healthcare system of, of all advanced economies. We'll be told it's the best. It's not. So how do the Tories cover up their failure to support the NHS? After all, the British public are huge fans of the NHS. If you show them that the Tories are destroying it, they would absolutely stop voting for them. Guaranteed. Well, they're sneaky. They claim that they're increasing the level of funding for the NHS. I mean, what can you expect a government to do? Increase funding. We're increasing the funding. The thing is, it's a lie, but it's a cunning one. They have increased funding for health care, but they force the NHS to contract services out. So a lot of the public funding that goes to the NHS doesn't stay there. It has to be spent on private contracts for a range of services. And remember, that's your public money being spent on profits. So the actual amount of money being spent on the NHS is way down. The actual amount of money even being spent on healthcare, whether it's for the NHS or private, is still down. Because once you take that profit out of there, the total amount of funding that's going on spending on actual healthcare is down. But the official figures are going up because they count all the money being funneled through the NHS to private contractors as NHS funding. But it's not. If Ben says to me, look, I'm not going to see Jimmy for a while, I owe him a tenner, and he gives me the tenner to pass on to Jimmy. He hasn't given me the tenner, I'm just passing it from one person to another. It's obscene. The government are deliberately depriving the NHS of staff. They are deliberately allowing horrendous staff shortages to occur, I believe, in order to force the system to collapse. And collapse it is doing. The way it works is this. Nurse leaves the ward. They can't be replaced because there aren't enough. Even harder now because we've made it more difficult for EU nurses to take up positions in the UK. Because we don't pay nurses enough, that creates two problems for attracting foreign nurses from wherever, the EU, elsewhere. But particularly for the EU, because the first is they may be able to get better pay in a different country. And for, as I say, for EU nurses in particular, there's also no visa process for working in a different EU country. So the process is way easier for another country and they may get paid more. But the second problem is the Home Office doesn't class nurses as being in desperate shortage. Some categories of nurse, yes, but nurses in general, no. And because the pay isn't high enough, it's sometimes difficult to get the immigration points for foreign nurses to work here. 
Certainly, it massively reduces the number of potential nurses available to us from around the world. The situation should be, the, 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 the shortages are into the tens of thousands for nurses. The situation should be this simple. Is this nurse from wherever in the world suitably qualified and willing and able to work in the NHS? If the answer is yes, we should be welcoming with open arms and we're not. And the NHS is very reliant on foreign doctors and nurses, not even close to the number required in the UK. And no, we're not massively ramping up the number we're training in this country either, even though that would still take years to come through. We make the process of training, like to be a nurse especially, far too costly for those who might be interested. Then we have COVID on top of it. Hospitals are ordered to, you see, notice in some hospitals that you're only supposed to wear surgical masks. These are inferior against Omicron variants. It should be FFP2 at least. So the government have introduced rules that are designed to allow COVID to spread. Madness, except it's not. Strategy, I think. They fail to fund the NHS properly, so it's harder to attract the staff. As staff leave, nurse leaves, say, harder to replace them. So then their team has to work harder to cover for their reduced numbers. Well, this is exhausting. So more of them leave. Maybe they even leave the profession because the work is soul-destroying, exhausting and poorly paid. Then they introduce an immigration system that is a barrier to some foreign nurses. They don't put nurses on the exceptions list. So they reduce the potential labour market for NHS workers. Then they let Covid run riot. So lots of the existing staff are too ill to work at any one time. Can't all be coincidence. Has to be deliberate. Which brings me on to an interesting article I was reading in the Financial Times of all places. Now, this is a place I go to for economic news, as you might imagine. There's quite good Brexit news in there as well. It's not often I find myself interested in healthcare news there, but this was fascinating. So, because we've never taken mitigations against COVID seriously in the UK, we have unleashed a horrendous toll on our population in the form of COVID staff absences, but also long COVID. In the UK right now, there are lots of workers off sick. Quite simply, due to a combination of factors, including Brexit, our workforce is smaller now than it was in 2019. We don't have enough workers being productive. Of course, our economy is suffering. The Brexit impact has meant we can't get foreign workers easily into the country. The healthcare impact means that some workers are too ill to work. That would have been the case with or without Brexit. But for the purpose of this video, I'm focusing on those too ill to work, of course. And, and I'd have put this down essentially to long COVID. After all, I'd have thought to myself, what other factor could there be? Brexit is reducing the number of people we can bring into the country, but it's not making them ill. Well, there is another factor as suggested by this article. It suggests that there's something very odd about the UK. <laughs> yes, I know. A particular thing that's odd about the UK. Lots of countries suffered a drop in workforce due to the pandemic. Of course they did. But it has started to climb again. But it hasn't for the UK. They showed graphs of major economies, which shows the UK as the only country where the proportion of working age people outside of the labour force has carried on rising. I know we occasionally win the Euro Millions. We're quite good at that in this country, but I don't think that's all Euro Millions winners. There are some countries where it's still above the pre-pandemic trend, so they still haven't fully recovered, but only in the UK has it just kept rising. Just kept rising and rising. And the report puts this down to not just long COVID, which other countries will suffer in form, some form as well. Because remember, I know the UK has been pretty bad with mitigations, but it's not the only one. There have been other advanced economies that have had a very poor attitude towards mitigations as well. This report puts it down to the critical state of the NHS. Because here's how the process is supposed to work. You have something wrong, you go to the doctor. You have a series of tests which results in a diagnosis. You receive treatment, the problem is sorted, you're back to full health and fitness. And I know modern medicine doesn't have all the answers, so some problems, yes, divide the diagnosis, some treatments are not always certain, but in many cases, this is the pattern, right? But what if there's a delay in getting a diagnosis or treatment? Well, then your condition, if it's not something that will just naturally heal itself, will worsen. That means you lose health or fitness as you wait for treatment. And also it means that by the time you do get treatment, it can't be as effective. 
you will always have some loss, permanent loss of health or fitness. Some people are waiting years longer than would have been the case under a Labour government or indeed any government that would have actually taken the NHS seriously. And this is what this report thinks is causing part of our problems. We've broken the NHS. The Tories have been trying for so long and now it's finally happened. The front page of the Mirror today talked about a shortage of 12,000 doctors and 50,000 nurses. Note that this is worse than when Boris Johnson became Prime Minister. So don't imagine that this is, as he often tries to suggest, a failure of Theresa May or David Cameron that he was turning the tide. No, he's presided over the worsening of the situation as well. This is to say nothing of paramedics, porters and other essential staff. As I say, the overall staffing shortage in the NHS are over 100,000. As I see it, the simple fact of the situation is not that the NHS in date is in danger. We're past that point. The NHS is now broken. It's gone. It's knackered. It'll take a lot of years to put it right again. But the government we have for another two and a half years at least don't want to put it right. They want to turn it into a privately funded system and they want to they want to hasten themselves before Labour get in. In fact, if they even start to think that they might not win the next general election, they will rush, they will push themselves. There's a new report out arguing for hospital patients to pay for their stay in the wards. Thin end of the wedge. Now, this is just a report, not government policy, but the fact it's been reported suggests to me it might find favour with ministers. Maybe the report is intended to start a conversation. You can see how this conversation is intended to go. The government claim they're providing record funding, but it's not enough. It's still failing. We keep putting the money in and it's still failing. It's a lie, but the media will back it up. So we need more money, they say. But public funding can only go so far. We need private investment, they'll say. We already have loads of services privately funded. We still need more money. Well, why not charge people for treatment? Just a few pounds, of course. Nothing to break the bank. And then you have the total collapse of the system. The project, the NHS project, was always predicated on the principle you pay for it through taxation. It's not free. You pay for it. But the treatment is free at the point of contact. That way, you don't have to be like Americans worrying about how much the treatment's going to cost you. It's already paid for. As you work, you pay for it. This will change that. The NHS is already broken. The Tories will almost certainly accelerate their plans to go in for the kill. And you know what? Not a damn thing we can do about it. I said this after the last election. You know, people right now are saying we urgently need a general election. Waste of time. We're not going to get one. The price was paid in 2019. The price for people not voting for the alternative to the Tories was giving the Tories a large majority and a blank check to do with as they please, for five years at least. That is the consequence of being snippy in an election. Oh, well, I'm not voting for them because they're not quite right on this. That is the consequence. That is the consequence. And we have to live for it for another two and a half years. And it won't all magically go away if we do get rid of them. It is going to be a lot of years. And if we let them back in five years later, it'll all go up the swanny again. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.